Hi, welcome back to the channel. I'm Mike with Northwest School of Fly Fish and the Old Fish Hobo. I'm here to talk to you about the facts of the blue winged olive hatch. Some people call them betas, some people call them blue winged olives. Uh, betas by their Latin name, blue winged olive by their pattern name. Some old guys like me, we call them olives. Be as it may, it's happening here all over the West and most of our rivers, certainly in many rivers across America. And it's the most important hatch uh, that we have as anglers. Certainly uh, the most important mayfly hatch we have anyway. And it's happening right now and, and now's the time to really get these basic facts out to you. So I can do a, a two hour seminar on, and I have, on, on the blue-winged olive hatch and where I'm talking about their emergence, the etymology of it, the flies we use, and how we fish them, the strategies, techniques, and all that stuff, but no one's gonna sit and watch, you know, a, a two hour seminar. So basically what I've done is I've just gonna key in on these key facts that will help you become a better angler at understanding the blue-winged olive hatch. Certainly will, will help you on the river next time you go out there. And for you other old fish hobos out there been fishing forever, uh, there might be a nugget or two out here that you can use too. Uh, first thing you need to understand about the blue-winged olive hatch is that we get it twice a year. We get it in the spring and we get it in the fall. So it's always the first mayfly on the water and the fish gorge on them. It's always the mayfly, the last mayfly on the water in the fall and the trout gorge on them. It's like they, they got this brand new steak in the spring and it's the last meal they're gonna have in the fall. You can have two hatches or two emergences going on in, on the same river on the same day. Uh, most, a lot of rivers, or probably the majority of rivers, will just see it once a day. But don't be surprised if you go to a river and it's happening twice a day. I know we have a couple of rivers like that where, where I fish here in Idaho, uh, where you can see a late afternoon, um, excuse me, a late morning hatch, and then a mid to late morning uh, hatch. Same size, same bug, just twice. Um, so keep that in mind too. So don't be surprised if it's, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning you're seeing blue-winged olives out, knowing that you're going to see them again around 3.30. It can happen and it does happen. The blue-winged olive hatch has two broods, as we just said. It has a, a spring and a fall. But the real difference between this bug is uh, the size. And size is critical because part of the trigger mechanism or what causes a trout or what triggers a trout to take a, a dry fly is size. And size is so critical in this blue winged olive hatch. Your success or your failure uh, in casting blue winged olives or rising fish can be the size. Uh, in, the, in the fall, uh, they're always size 20s and 22s, 21s. You know, they're really small. Uh, and you need to, 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 to make sure that you're fishing a variety of different patterns that size. And in the spring, they're size 16s and size 18s and maybe a size 15. But the majority of that hatch is usually a small size 18. So the logic is, 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 is in the fall, you don't want to use a size 18 blue winged off when the fish are slurping 20s and 22s and vice versa because that is a trigger mechanism, remember? It's the size. So as that bug reaches their window of sight, uh, they're keying in on hundreds if not thousands of the same identical clone bug and all of a sudden you float something by that's a little small, a little bigger, or a little smaller, and, and trout has little or no cognitive thought, and it, it will refuse that. So size is a critical, really critical uh, uh, aspect in, in blue-winged olive fishing. Uh, also, uh, when we think of blue-winged olives, we think of certainly when you go to a, 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 a fly shop or a box store and have boxes of flies, uh, we see blue-winged olives and they have, just like the, the the name says they have a blue winged and they have an olive body. Uh, but there's a fallacy there in the sense that a blue winged olive, uh, unlike, let's say, a pale morning dun mayfly, uh, a blue winged olive is going to have a range of different body colors. It can be dark gray, it can be black, it can be brown, it can be dark, dark brown, it can be deep dark olive, or it can be a medium olive or a bright olive. And you need to know that because every river is different. Now, rivers are like people, they're all different. They all have the same blue-winged olive hatch, uh, but they have different, the, the rivers are different how they set, set themselves up for the times that these hatches happen, certainly the colors. And it, and it helps you to get a little shrimp net that extends out and scoop one off and look at the size and key in on, on the, really the body color. And why am I so adamant on that? Because the body color, the color of the fly is a trigger mechanism also. Impression or image of the fly at the surface 
size and color. That's what causes a trout to take your dry fly. So you're off in color, off in size. You, you take a, a, a mayfly hatch that's really simple and now you make it really difficult on yourself. So so be, be cognizant of, of the size or, and the color of these flies. Uh, if you're going to err, uh, Air on being too small than too big, and that's just common in fly fishing. When we get a refusal, it's usually because our flies are too big. And, and, and if I just weigh them all up, airing too big, airing too small, uh, airing too big, you're probably not going to catch many. Airing too small, you're probably going to catch more. So it helps you to uh, uh, understand that about which time of the year you're fishing the blue winged olive hatch. Understanding that that blue winged olive in their nymphal form, they're swimmers. So there's four categories, burrowers, clingers, and uh, swimmers, and this mayfly is a swimmer, and they will swim all along different places. Therefore, they don't like to be in really fast moving water because it makes it obviously logically hard to swim. They like that medium fast water where they can move around, and that's going to make a difference when it comes to the emergence. So understanding that they're swimmers is going to help you understand, put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, they like to emerge uh, in water temperatures between 45 and 55. And that's usually when that's going to happen. So you can regulate where you're going to be on, if you're on a tailwater, how far you are from a dam. Uh, right at the dam, it's going to be extremely cold. Farther down the canyon, it's going to warm up a little bit. Uh, it'll get warmer certain times of day and colder certain times of day. And uh, you, you can see a blue and olive hatch on this section of the river. It's going to be a little different than that section of the river. Uh, but you get much colder than 45, <clears throat> and it makes these... these uh, uh, Bugs a little lethargic, and they slow down their metabolism, slow down, and it's, it's the opposite. Uh, at 55, the water warms up, and they get a little lethargic. But that key temperature is 45 to, to 55 degrees, and because um, uh, blue-winged olives are swimmers. Um, if you know that the hatch is going on, it happens every day at 3 o'clock, uh, you get there a couple hours early and you can nymph uh, blowing doll of nymphs. And, and you could be nymphing into that emergence and you might be able to pick up uh, just a few fish before you even started throwing a dry fly. Uh, and, and because their swimmers are moving around, and, and, and in general, uh, they're getting ready to emerge anyway, and, and trout will actually key in at times on, on those things. So it helps you to uh, give you a few more trout ahead of time, or gives you something to do before the hatch happens. Uh, this, ha this hatch, the blue dollar hatch, uh, it's, it takes a long time for this emergence to happen, meaning uh, they, have, they, swim, they, they swim slowly to the surface, and that, that meniscus is pretty pliant. It's like saran wrap and it's pretty thick and it, and, it, and it takes them a while to break through that and then they have to they crawl out of their nymphal shucks and they're half in, half out before they really pop into their done or adult stage. That's a long drift versus uh, say a PMD which is fairly quick. It's, they motor up, pop, out, and gone. And this, this has an, an effect on how you fish them. And for example, uh, we know that that blueing dollars will emerge in that in a, in a long tail out, and it'll happen at the beginning of the tail out and go all the way down to the very end. And so, trout that are at the very top of this tail out are seeing nothing but the the uh, the nymphal form or the nymph form of the emerger, uh, and then. As they as they start to emerge and it works their way down to the tail out or the or the uh, eddies, they're at their full done stage and trout will start eating them. So if you have a a nymphal uh, emerger or or, or a blue and olive nymph and you're down here where the duns are and the fish can't catch them and you switch to a dun to catch them and then you move up and you still have that dun on it, it's just floating by. So understanding that long drift will help you. Uh, um, on the water. Uh, a technique that I like to do is if I'm at a, at a river and I haven't been there in a while or it's a new river to me, um, I will I will tie on a, a, a blowing doll of parachute and around the bend of the hook use a nymphal behind it like a split case uh, uh, blowing doll of. And now uh, I've got it both covered 
all three transitions. And uh, once, and then I, I can work it all the way through the drift. And, and, and that's a good strategy for you to go by. And because it's a long drift like that, um, trout prefer eating the merger over that of the dun. A lot of mistakes we make in, in casting uh, uh, flies to uh, feeding trout during a blue winged olive hatch is we're constantly throwing the, the dun or the adult on there. We're, we're trying to really key in on the nymphal part of that because it's such a long drift. They're seeing more and more uh, hundreds if not thousands of these blue winged olives in or just under the meniscus. And that's what they're keying in on. And all of a sudden you float this 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 little dry fly out there and it's just gonna go right over them. And it's not back there till you get it. So because it's such a long drift, they're seeing all these things in front of them. And another key thing that for you to keep uh, and understand is 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 these bugs don't don't do a spinner fall. They don't all come up here and mate. Uh, they'll go to shore and they'll mate on shore. Uh, and when they're, when they're mated on shore, both the females and the males will actually crawl out into the river, crawl into the river to lay their eggs. So it's, it's not traditionally made up here. Uh, the, the males die and the females come down and they start laying their eggs and then they die. It doesn't work like that with the PMD, or excuse me, with the blue-winged olive. Uh, that's why nymphing prior to and after can be pretty good uh, if you're nymphing that nymphal uh, merger. <clears throat> Uh, and a single hatch can come in a wave. It's like this. So it's, it's all one hatch, it just comes in waves. And I've seen this happen many times. <clears throat> where uh, uh, recently I was on the river and I uh, found a spot and I saw fish were rising and I saw, I mean, I had seen fish rising as I drove by and on my way back I saw this angler coming up and as I was walking down to talk to him, uh, I said, are you all done? He goes, yeah, I, I, I can't catch these things. It just, the hatch is over. So I walked back down there and I was there maybe 10 minutes and here they come again, you know. So. Uh, Typically, when you're looking at a blue-winged olive hatch, it's a fairly long hatch, but it can come in those waves like that, and be prepared for that. And I use a 6X tippet, and I know a lot of guys that, that uh, a lot of really, really hardcore anglers will use 6X tippet because it, it's, it's much more smaller, much more thinner, and it lays on the water better when you're using really small flies uh, versus a heavier. You can use 5X. Um, and, and use 5X uh, successfully, uh, and some guys do, but I prefer 6X and I would recommend that you do, you too. So these are some of the facts. Uh, see if you can apply these to uh, what you're doing, because odds are, uh, if you're gonna be on a, on a river, you're gonna see blue-winged olives, little gray things floating around in the sky like that, uh, and, and floating on the river, you gotta be a blue-winged olive hatch. And finally, the, 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 the final fact is, uh, if you're a fly fisherman and knowing what I just told you, you should have two fly boxes for the blue-winged olives. You should have a spring blue-winged olive box and a fall blue-winged olive box. You don't want one box with a bunch of blue-winged olives because it's very hard for you to distinguish between what's a size 20, 22 and what's a size 18. And, and you can make that mistake. So uh, I have uh, two boxes of size 20s and I have two boxes of size 18s and I won't even use the 18s to spring. Uh, so when I'm on the river, I have everything in front of me. I can choose the patterns I want uh, and I can work a progression of flies and have the right size in front of me. Only two things catch fish, the fly rod and the fly. Your ability to use the fly rod and your knowledge of skills of flies. He who dies with the most flies wins. He who has the most patterns, size 20 and 22 during the fall, wins. I'll see you on the river.